I want you this morning to take your Bible and go to the book of Psalm chapter 93. And I want to show you verse number 4 this morning. And I may be the only preacher in the entire world today that does not directly preach on the resurrection. This morning, my heart is on a verse that the Lord opened my eyes to this past week. In the 93rd Psalm and verse number 4, the Bible says, The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. This morning, preachers all around the country will take a message, a text, and they'll put a a title to it. And every message needs a title. And sometimes preachers have to come up with the titles of those messages, and then sometimes the messages title themselves. And I take the title this morning right out of that phrase, The Lord on high is mightier. If you look at the beginning of Psalm chapter 93, if you have a Bible in your hand or on your phone, you'll find that this is a nameless psalm. It does not have anything attributed. We do not know who wrote it. We don't know upon what occasion it was to be sung. But though this might be a nameless psalm, it is not a pointless psalm. Because there is a lesson that the psalm writer wanted to know And wanted the people to find. And you'll find that lesson if you look back in verse number 1. Look in this chapter, if you will, in Psalm 93 and verse 1. The lesson to be learned from this psalm is the very first phrase, The Lord reigneth. Spurgeon called this the psalm of sovereignty. It's interesting to me that it starts out when it says the Lord reigneth. That phrase reigneth, it is the the Hebrew word which literally means to crown someone king. I tell you this morning that the psalmist was reminding the people of God that the Lord is king. That there is nothing above Him. Now you and I have got to understand Kings of old days were not the same as kings today. Kings today that rule and reign in our world, they are not all powerful. They're very, in fact, I do not know of what we would call an absolute monarchy that still exists in the world. Maybe in one of the tribes of the jungle somewhere, but nowhere in mainstream world. But in the old days, people that were kings had what we would call an absolute monarchy. What that means was they did not bow to parliament. Parliament bowed to them. They did not bow to law because the word that came from their mouth was law. They did not bow to any person because all people bowed to them. Today, our kings bow to parliaments and our kings bow to popular opinion and our kings bow to laws, not kings and old. But there is one king that reigns today that does truly not bow to anything or anybody. And David or the psalmist here reminds us in verse number 1 that the Lord is king. Therefore, when you crown the king up here, everything else falls below it. Therefore, he is the king. Is he the king over sickness? Yes, he's the king over sickness. Is he the king over cancer? Yes, he's the king over cancer. Is he the king over the church? Yes, he's the king over the church. Is he the king over your life? Yes, he is the king over your life. Is he the king of the world? Yes, he is the king of the world. Is he the king of the demons? Yes, he is king over the demons. Is he the king of life? Yes, he's the king over life. Is he the king of death? Yes, he's the king over death. Because our Lord reigneth. Our God is in control. And upon that basis, the psalmist builds this phrase and he says, The Lord who is king is on high and He is mightier than the noise of many waters. I remind you this morning that no matter what happens in this world down here, that our Lord is 
mightier. I know today people will sit in houses and they will be in their cars or they'll have to be in an office somewhere, but they will not be in the house of God. I remind you this morning, the Lord on high is still mightier. There is nothing that we need to be reminded of more in this day, in this hour, in this month, in this year, than the Lord on high is mightier. Ladies and gentlemen of the church of Jesus Christ, the Lord on high is mightier. Now we've got preachers that want to pomp and pump and make you think they're on high. No, no, no. God is the King and we are the servants. The church is not the King, but God is the King. The government is not the King, but God is the King. May we be reminded today that there is no disease that is King, but the Lord reigneth and He is on high. And David or the psalmist reminds us of that. I do think it's David's why I keep saying that, but I don't want to be corrected and I don't want your emails. So I just will say what the Bible says, the psalmist, okay? But here is what it says, that the Lord on high is mightier. Now, I remind you this morning, I love my Bible. I love my King James Bible, but there's a part of the translation this morning in the way that the translators line this up that it does not make sense to our English mind what God wrote down in the Hebrew mind. And when you get it in the Hebrew language, it doesn't translate in the exact order in which God wanted it to say. So without offending the Bible, and without offending the Holy Ghost, and without grieving my soul, I want to give to you three phrases that are in here in our Bible, but we're just going to mix the order up just a hair. I want to show you the three phrases. Number one, I want to show you the noise of many waters. Number two, I want to show you the Lord on high. Then I want to show you number three is mightier. That's what it ought to say. It ought to say the noise of many waters. Yea, the noise of mighty waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mightier. That's the way it ought to be written out. But it doesn't grieve God for us to take it like this, so that's what we'll do. Number one, let me show you the noise of many waters. You say, preacher, what is that? That is the storm on the sea because we're looking at the language. And when you're out in a boat and you're surrounded by many waters and the waves begin to make noises, what's causing those waves to make noise? What is it? It is a storm. And that's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying there is a storm that's brewing around us. Now remember, he goes on that based off the premise of verse 1. Though the storm is raging, the Lord still reigneth. He says the noise of many waters. Now let me show you a few things in this and see if I can apply it to where you're at. Number one, he tells us that this storm has a taunt. It has a voice. You see, every storm you and I are in, it talks to us and it speaks to us and it preaches to us and it taunts us and it mocks us. Look at what it says in verse number four. It says the noise of many waters. That word noise, it's the Hebrew word and it literally means the chant or the taunt. You see, I used to be, I hadn't always been saved. I want to remind you of that. And you hadn't always been saved. I used to be meaner than a junkyard dog. I'm sweeter than sugar now. But I used to be as mean as a rattlesnake. And when I was a boy in school, I was not the one being picked on. I was the one doing the picking. I am reminded that today, if I was in school today, I'd probably have been expelled a long time ago, but that's a different story for a different time. And don't you dare look at your screen like you're some religious uh, phenomenon that has never messed up. You're a religious hypocrite just like I am, and we all need Jesus and salvation. But here's what I used to do. If I found somebody in school that I didn't like so much or they were doing something better, I would taunt them. I would mock them and make fun of them. And every time they would come by, I'd say something and I would chant to them. 
That is what David or this psalmist says the storm does to you and I. You realize the storm in your life right now? It does that taunting. It does that chanting. It does that mocking to you. You know what it'll tell you? It'll say it's out of your control. Every time you think you're going up and things begin to go down, that storm will begin to preach at you. And it'll say it's out of your control. Things are falling apart. Everything's gotten out of your hands. You can't control your marriage anymore. You can't control your church anymore. You can't control your mind anymore. You can't control your health anymore. You can't control your finances anymore. You can't control your job anymore. God's not listening. God's not there. And everything's falling apart. That health report comes back. And that storm, those waves begin to roll. And the waves begin to crash. And the waves begin to go. And you wake up in the middle of the night. And something has woke you up. And it's telling you, it's not going to be okay. Life's never going to be the same. Life's never going to go back to the way it was. There are people right now and your anxiety is out the roof because of this coronavirus and because of the diseases and because of the shutdowns and everything's telling you it's out of control. It's never going to be the same and fear abounds. That's the taunt of the storm. Look at what else it says. It says this storm, not watch what it says, the noise of many waters... The noise, the mighty waves of the sea. That phrase mighty is an interesting word. It literally means wide and large. It has the idea of covering a lot of space. You know what that's saying? He's saying there is nowhere my boat is going that the storm is not. Have you ever been that way? Have you ever felt that way? That everywhere you turned, the storm was raging. Everywhere you turned, the waves were rolling. Everywhere you went, your fear overwhelmed you. Everywhere you were, it just crashed against you and crashes against you and crashes against you. Everywhere you go, the mighty waves of the sea, they roll against your mind. They roll against your thoughts. And your your ship goes left or right and the waves turn right. Ship goes left and your mind goes left and the fear goes left. Everywhere you go, the storm is everywhere. Your ship can go nowhere that the storm is not, where the, the storm is not. Now I'm going somewhere and I wanted to get you there before I got there. Okay? Notice number three, the waves. He says, the mighty waves of the sea, the mishbar, the breakers, the billows. That's the tenacity of the storm. God began to put something in my heart the other day and think about it. The smallest wave can decimate the largest mountain if you give it enough time. No matter how small the wave, if you give it enough time of crashing over and over and over, it will erode the biggest mountain. If the storm of your life, no matter how small, you give it enough time... And those breakers and billows and crashing waves will tear you down. It's that little word that somebody whispers to you over and over and over and over and it rips you down and it tears you down and it destroys your patience. It destroys your confidence. It destroys what you are. It's that bill that you can never seem to get paid. It's that relationship that never seems to get better. It's that health report that never seems to improve. It's maybe maybe you're trying to do something. Maybe you're trying to accomplish something and you can never get ahead and that wave, it just keeps rolling over you and it keeps crashing against the side of your boat and it keeps crashing against the side of your life and it tears you down and tears you down and tears you down and tears you down and that's what he said. He said the storm is on the sea. It's tearing me down. But he goes to number two, that second phrase that I wanted to show you. That's the noise of many waters. Look back at verse four. He says the Lord On high. Now I want you to notice something about this position. Watch what he says. The Lord, where? On high. 
Brothers and sisters, that phrase on high, it means to be in an elevated position. It means to be above it. It means to rise beyond it. It means not to be influenced by it. It means not to be worried about it. Ladies and gentlemen, you do realize, and I have got to realize, that our God is not in this mess. Our God is not influenced by this mess. I know that I'm influenced by the economy. You're influenced by the economy. Our government's influenced by the... I've often wondered who is actually in control of this whole thing. Everywhere you turn, I thought, man, if there's just one person in charge of the stock market, tell them to turn it off and we'll crank it back up after this thing's over. People act like, but here's the point. We, everybody is influenced by it. The man that pushes the button and the man that plays the game. The man that's in the game and the man on the sidelines. We're all influenced by this because we're in the storm. But I remind you this morning that our God is not in the storm. Our God is above the storm. Our God's not in the waves. Our God's on the... You say, give me an example. Matthew chapter 14, Peter, James, John, and the twelve disciples and a few of his followers are in a boat and they're in the storm going to the other side. And they look around and they say, where is Jesus? Does He not care that we perish? Does He not care that we're going down? All of a sudden as their ship is about to go down, they look out across the waves and guess where they found the Lord. They didn't find Him in the storm. They find Him on top of the storm. They didn't find Him in the wave. They find Him walking on the wave because the Lord on high. Our God is not scared. Our God is not in trouble. Our God is not afraid. Our God is still on high. If our God's on high, you know what that means? Number one, that means He sees everything I'm going through because He's up there and not down here. He sees every aspect of my life and He sees every aspect of your life. The Lord on high. That means He also cares. You know why and how I know he cares? Because if he's on high he's looking down low. If he didn't care, he would not be looking. Our God cares so much about you. He cares about your life. He cares about your home. He cares about your job. He cares about your thoughts. He cares about your heart. He cares about your health. He cares about your dog. He hates your cat. Say amen right there. He cares about absolutely everything that is in your life. Every aspect. Every atom. Every molecule. Every dime. Every dollar. Our God is on high and He cares about everything. He's not just God. In the storm, He's God over the storm. That's the storm, then that's the sovereign. But then I want to show you this third little point, if you'll let me. The Lord on high is what? Mightier. The Lord on high is... We've already seen that word one time in this scripture. Remember what I said about that storm? That word mighty, it has two word pictures. The first word picture, it has to do with covering space. You see, it said the storm and the mighty waves. That meant there was nowhere the ship could go that the storm was not. But here it does not say the Lord is mighty. What does it say? The Lord is mightier. You see, there's nowhere my ship can go that the storm is not. But there's nowhere the storm can go that my God is not. There's nowhere in my life I feel like I can turn and get out of this mess. Have you had that moment yet where you wake up and say, Is this all a dream? Is this for real? Have you had that moment? I had that moment yesterday. I was thinking, Man, Resurrection Sunday's coming. Easter Sunday's coming. i got to make sure i got my suit. And then I thought... Only people going to see it are going to be the people out there. You see, everywhere I turned, my ship was in a storm. And the storm taunts you and reminds you, you'll never get out of the control of the storm. That's okay. Because the storm needs to be reminded that it'll never get outside of the control of God. You and I have got to remember, the Lord on high is mightier. But there's a second word picture. And this second word picture is where it's at. That word mightier, it's got the word picture of a large ship. Here's what the psalmist is really saying. 
He's saying the waves and the billows are crashing around me. But the Lord's ship, it's stronger. You see, you and I have got to understand that our God's got a lot of experience in building boats. In fact, He built a boat one time that was so strong that the entire world began to shake and rock and the very foundations of the world began to crumble and the fountains of heaven, the windows of heaven began to blow down and it flooded the entire earth. But He had built an ark so strong that it saved Noah and the eight people and two of every kind of every animal on that ark. You say, does He have experience building a ship? Lord, honey, does He ever. You see, at Calvary one day, He took three nails and two pieces of wood and He began to assemble the greatest ship that has ever been built in all of humanity. And we call it the old ship of Zion. We call it the old ship of the church. And on top of Mount Calvary, honey, the shipbuilder began to lay down the foundation and he began to lay down the bulkhead of that ship in the blood of his son. He sapped it on one side with blood and he's been sapping it on the other side with blood for the last 2,000 years. It was at the back of the Vandalia Baptist Church on the other side of Greensboro that I got entered into the old ship of Zion as it passed my way and I saw the good captain on top of the ship as he waved and bid me to come on board. I wonder, have you ever entered the old ship of Zion? Have you ever called on the name of the captain of the Lord's host, the Lord's Savior? His name is Jesus. And the captain of that ship, he came by my way one day and he bid me to come on board. And you know what I've found that though the storms of sin have blown against my soul and though the storms of life have blown against my soul and though the storms of depression have blown against my soul and the billows have raised against the side of my salvation I find that the ship it's been built strong I find the ship has been built powerful and though the waves may roll that the Lord on high He is mightier than the soul that blow against my life. I want to read you a little poem and I'm going to bid you farewell this morning. The poem is called Out of the Darkness. Out of the dark forbidding soil the pure white lilies grow. Out of the black and murky clouds descends the stainless snow. Out of the crawling earth-bound worm, a butterfly is born. Out of the somber shrouded night, behold the golden morn. Out of the pain and stress of life, the peace of God pours down. Out of the nails, the spear, the cross, redemption and a crown. Beloved, It's the darkness of the night that makes the morning so beautiful. It's the pain of childbirth that makes the beauty of the baby so wonderful to hold. It's the pain that we're all in right now that's going to make the beauty of this all when it's over A picture that people will want to look at. It's the shame of sin that makes the beauty of forgiveness worth having. And I remind you this morning that the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters.